Here we go. And for the first talk of the conference, we're very happy to have Julian Sonner from the University of Geneva that'll tell us about causal symmetry breaking. So Julian, please, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Alex. So I, of course, want to start by thanking the organizers for putting together what looks like an extremely interesting meeting. Um, and I guess I ex especially thank them to have this meeting in Geneva, although, of course, I might be one of the only people who is actually here currently. This is a fake background. It looks nothing like this, but sometimes in the summer it does look like this. OK, so um, the title of my talk is Causal Symmetry Breaking, and I want to talk about a perspective on the theory of quantum chaotic systems, which I believe to be useful in the context of many of the topics and discussions that will come up at this conference. So um, I'm giving a talk here, which is based on one published paper together with Alex Altland at the University of Cologne. Uh, and I'm going to also refer to uh, two forthcoming papers, which are in collaboration with uh, also Alexander Altland with Pranjal Nayak, who is a postdoc here at the University of Geneva, Manuel Vielma, and um, a second uh, bit of work together with Alex Berlin, who you just heard from, with Jan de Boer and with Pranjal Nayak. So um, as an introduction, of course, uh, in some sense, this is the introduction to the conference, but I'm not going to give a you know, very detailed overview of these things because we're going to hear from many people um, and they're very interesting perspective on these things. But one of the reasons why we're all here, I think, is that uh, quantum mechanical unitarity and gravitational physics have long had what one might call a fraught relationship. So examples are, you know, things related to the so-called black hole information problem, um, which of course uh, originally was proposed by Hawking. Um, but more recently, of course, also the idea of uh, the unitary page curve or the, the lack of having a unitary page curve until recently. And perhaps more, uh, you know, simpler observables such as, for example, long time behavior of operator correlation functions. So for example, two point functions. And of course, many more other signatures of this fraught relationship between quantum mechanical unitarity and gravitational physics. Now, the reason why these paradoxes arise are actually um, our attempts to interpret black holes themselves as thermodynamic entities. And that's, of course, something that goes back to the pioneering work of Bekenstein and Hawking. So one strategy, uh, one strategy that I believe has come out um, in particular of trying to confront this fraught relationship uh, within the context of holographic duality is, well, if black holes are thermodynam thermodynamic entities, then it is probably a good idea to study quantum thermalization, in particular quantum thermalization in gravitational systems or in holographic duality, gravitational systems and their dual field theories. Um, and it's also judicious to do so at all relevant timescales. So timescales will also be a topic of my talk and I guess I'll, I'll come back to what these timescales might be. But what this leads to is um, uh, basically it leads us to think about ideas of quantum chaos and quantum ergodicity. And in a context, maybe I'll give you an example context. Uh, you can see my cursor. Yes, you can see my cursor. Uh, for example, if we prepare an initial state, uh, a non-equilibrium high energy initial state, such that it leads to a non-equilibrium uh, evolution and eventual thermalization, um, then we can think of this as a process in gravity that leads to the formation of a black hole horizon and its subsequent evolution and possibly its eventual evaporation. So um, both of the examples that I mentioned, in my opinion at least, have recently enjoyed a spectacular new progress, uh, but at the same time also generated new kinds of fascinating questions. Um, and one of the most intriguing and important ones uh, concerns what um, might be called the role of the ensemble. So to briefly introduce uh, this problem, which again, I think will occupy many of us uh, during the talks of this conference. Basically, uh, gravity contains contributions, uh, so-called wormholes, which strongly suggests an average over an ensemble of quantum systems. So instead of thinking about a single quantum system, we think of an ensemble of many quantum systems. And to my mind, uh, we can have two attitudes. Uh, one attitude is that the ensemble is entirely fundamental. So again, in the, in, in the context of holographic duality, this would say that the bulk theory 
is actually dual to a boundary ensemble of theories. Or we could alternatively think of the ensemble as some sort of emergent notion. And in fact, um, thinking of the ensemble as an emergent notion, and as I want to argue as this talk goes on, uh, is basically extremely natural in the context of <clears throat> quantum chaos and quantum ergodicity. And in particular, uh, such uh, an emergent ensemble is understood in the context of disorder models and quantum chaotic models, or understood, let's say, up to a certain extent, of course. So um, the idea is therefore that um, we can take one system which stands for all and all for one. So I'm misquoting a little bit Dumas here, um, one for all, all for one. But this is essentially the framework that I'd like to uh, outline. So we'll develop a framework that allows us to understand the emergence of an ensemble using an effective field theory type approach. And the effective field theory that I will outline is based on a symmetry breaking uh, principle as is any uh, a good effective field theory. And this symmetry breaking principle we like to call uh, causal symmetry breaking. So understanding causal symmetry breaking and its implication will lead to an effective field theory description of quantum chaos, which I believe to be, um, let's say certainly useful in the context of this discussion. In particular, um, it gives us some conceptually useful insights because it can explain the role of ensemble individual theories. And it gives um, a reason to accept the occurrence of wormholes uh, with connection to individual theories. But on the other hand, it also is technically a very efficient tool. Um, it's a very efficient tool. Uh, and I will illustrate that by giving you various calculations that become possible once one has formulated this effective field theory. And so, for example, it makes specific quantitative predictions related to random matrix theory. You can give a reformulation of random matrix theory in this context. Also, uh, things like operator uh, statistics, like the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And at the very end, I will also comment on, um, well, something that we can say about random distributions of OPE coefficients. So um, that was the briefest of introductions. Um, and I hope that's okay. I, I believe that uh, many, many of these topics will receive much more attention in other talks as well. So uh, the part that I would like to move on to now is basically formulating, explaining to you this effective field theory of quantum chaos. So um, here is um, a conceptual uh, motivating slide so um, if we look at a quantum chaotic system, it makes sense to think about the uh, probability that you find two energy eigenvalues at a certain distance. So I'm labeling here the energy in terms of a variable S, which is basically the distance of energy levels in units of the mean level spacing. And so um, if we compare something like one chaotic system, um, often on sites, uh, systems like Sinai billiards, a non-integrable non uh, um, quantum system, and one asks for the histogram of the level spacings S, that's what I, uh, well, if I flatter myself, I give an artist's representation of this here in gray. Um, one finds that this histogram of uh, energy spacing distributions is well approximated by the result of Wigner, the so-called Wigner surmise, in this case, uh, in the orthogonal ensemble. So there is a curve that follows from a random matrix ensemble, and this curve is well approximated by the energy uh, level distribution of a single quantum system. So energy levels of a quantum chaotic system follow an RMT law in this sense. So we have to have uh, some binning here in energies in mind. And this happens uh, on the scale of a few delta. Delta is, the, uh, is in fact the mean level spacing. You see S is equal to one, it means one delta apart. So here is a sense in which we can associate already um, at least the idea of having an ensemble with a single system, with a Sinai Billets quantum system. Now, a related quantity that has received more attention in our community recent, recently is what's referred to as the spectral form factor. 
which uh, formally is the Fourier transform of the two-level correlation. Two-level correlation isn't exactly the same as this Wigner surmise, but it's a very related quantity. And in real time, this gives um, this characteristic behavior. So if we look at the log time versus log of k, k is this Fourier transform of the, of the spectral form factor, then we find that RMT would give a prediction where I have a certain linear rise, the so-called ramp, which at a time that is proportional to the um, exponential of the entropy of the system gives, uh, gives way to a plateau. And now the idea is that such a quantum chaotic system starts to be extremely well described by uh, the RMT prediction after a certain time. And this time is called <clears throat> the tauless time or the ergodic time. And so for times that are greater than the tauless time, the real system will in some sense be well approximated by the random matrix prediction. So there is some initial behavior, which is actually just comes from a disconnected contribution. Then there is some, uh, some oscillations here. And then I start um, being in some sense well approximated by this random matrix description. Now, how does causal symmetry come in? So uh, let's illustrate the main idea by just noticing that I can think about the density um, of energy levels in a quantum system as being the difference between the advanced and the retarded propagation function. So if we have a non-zero spectral density, technically speaking, along a finite interval, so rho is zero with finite support in E, then we have to have a difference between the G plus and the G minus type correlation function. And the key idea now is that we can understand this, and I will show you in a technical sense how, as a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So spontaneous symmetry breaking, meaning there's some mean field type uh, prediction for G plus and a mean field type prediction for G minus, where this average here denotes an average with respect to either the eigenstate ensemble, so for this is what I illustrated, for example, in the Sinai billets, or a small set of parameters. Um, well, in SYK, we know that it works for a sparse set of couplings, but one might also speculate whether something like this happens if you average, for example, over the Toft coupling in N equals to four, or perhaps some other coarse graining procedure that I haven't thought of yet. Um, that would be interesting to think about also in the context of certain other works that will come up in this conference and make a cross reference. Anyway, so um, of what theory is this the mean field? So the point of departure for the construction of this, uh, uh, of this uh, let's say mean field understanding in the first approximation is this generating functional of spectral resolvance. So a very convenient quantity to consider is this ratio of four determinants. Maybe I should make briefly the remark that I'm choosing, cho choosing this ratio of four determinants because it's uh, the right thing to do if I want to talk about two level correlation functions and this will be essentially the emphasis of my talk. But one can imagine also having higher order correlation functions in which case you would have an analogous object but with more than just two pairs of determinants. But the idea is that this um, allows you by by differentiating with respect to energies, so Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4 are energies, H is the Hamiltonian of my system. So by taking derivatives with respect to these energies, I can generate uh, basically um, the resolvent, and from this I can extract the spectral density. Now, um, why do I have determinants in the numerator and the denominator? Well, this is because if I differentiate a determinant, then I get back the determinant times trace of one over the operator. And I want to cancel that determinant factor. This, so this serves to normalize it. And I want to make the remark that this is, is in some sense similar to the replica trick, but technically a different realization. And then what I do is that I introduce auxiliary objects, these psi's, um, we all know how Gaussian integrals work. If I have a fermion, then I get a determinant in the numerator. If I have a boson, I get a determinant in the denominator. So I can generate this kind of object by making psi to be a graded super vector. L is the dimension of the Hilbert space. And I basically have four copies of the identical Hamiltonian. 
Um, and I have two L bosonic and two L fermionic degrees of freedom. Now notice that this object has an exact U2 slash two symmetry. That's the rotation that rotates between the Hamiltonian sectors and it's graded because this object here is graded. And uh, the only object here that weakly breaks this is this, uh, the, are these energies, which can be different in the four sectors. Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 can be different. And this difference in energies breaks weakly, but explicitly uh, this symmetry. This is what we call the causal symmetry because in the end, um, I, in order to get um, the spectral density, remember I had to have opposite causalities and this corresponds to having here the plus causality and here the minus causality. Um, and uh, so this U2 slash two can actually rotate these different causalities. That is why we call them causal symmetry. As a remark, there is actually a symmetry under exchange of Z1 and Z2 because there you don't have to fix the causality. The symmetry is referred to as a vial symmetry and we'll return to it. But the idea is now that um, one can show that the resulting theory in the mean field, so if rho is non-zero, it breaks this causal symmetry because we said precisely that uh, the rho is the difference between the two causal sectors. And the breaking pattern is that this u2 slash two is broken to u1 slash one times u1 slash one, which is a spontaneous breaking of the causal symmetry by a saddle point and are stabilized by the large dimension. Let's assume that the dimension of the Hilbert space is large. Now, um, the goldstones of this symmetry breaking are precisely the degrees of freedom that are used to construct the effective field theory of quantum chaos. Mm. I want to just remark already that these basically reproduce the physical content of a random matrix theory. So the content of what we usually associate with an ensemble average. And the way that we construct it actually parallels the way that we construct Goldstone effective field theories. We know about this very well because Coleman, Callan, Coleman, Wes and Zumino explained this to us in the late sixties, I believe. So um, we know what the coset is. It's this uh, follows from the symmetry breaking. We then have a degree of freedom Q which parameterizes this, this uh, coset and our effective field theory will be an integral over this, um, over this manifold. Um, I want to at this point maybe just um, jog your memory a little bit. This is conceptually very similar to the way we think about pions in QCD. Although the actual symmetries involved are of course different. But uh, you have what's called the chiral condensate which breaks the chiral symmetry, which here becomes what I like to call the causal condensate. So this mean field expectation value of G in terms of these uh, fermions of course is just an expectation value of psi bar and psi. But we also have another nice analogy here, which is that the quark mass M, which um, explicitly, but by a small amount breaks this the chiral symmetry is like the energy difference, which um, I call, um, well, let me call it omega. I'm afraid that here I actually use delta in the, in, the, in the sense of difference. For all of my talk, I tried to avoid it, but I forget here. Delta is the mean energy spacing. Here it is actually the, the, the energy difference. So omega is energy difference. Um, and I want to break it by a very small amount, let's say e to the minus entropy. So we have both a, a condensate that breaks the symmetry spontaneously and we have a small explicit breaking in both of these contexts. Although I repeat again that the symmetry groups that are involved are of course different. Now, um, another key point is that in this context here, there are actually two symmetry breaking saddles. So if you are careful about the analytic structure, which actually has to do with the fact that I had a Z plus in the upper half plane and a Z minus in the lower half plane, then the manifold is actually in the bosonic sector hyperbolic two space. And in the fermionic sector, it's a two sphere. And there are two different saddles which break this. There is what is referred to as the standard saddle, which we can put at the North Pole. And then there is a second alternative saddle, which is called the Andreev Altschuler saddle. Um, Interestingly, these two are related by the vial symmetry, second time that I remarked this. Now, and because the standard saddle actually uh, doesn't break the symmetry in the fermionic and bosonic, there was a symmetry between fermionic and bosonic components, it actually has zero, um, zero action. While the Andreev Altschula saddle has an action which is proportional to E to the entropy. 
So um, what we can do is then we can actually um, do a perturbative expansion, say, for example, around the standard saddle. And the good variable to do this perturbative expansion in is little s. This is standard notation. So there is, of course, big S, which is the entropy. Little s is actually the energy difference in units of the mean level spacing up to a factor of pi. Notice that this expansion is actually fully non-perturbative in terms of the microscopic theory because it's, it's of the order e to the minus s to the power n coming from the factor of the mean level spacing here. And then perhaps even more intriguing, the second saddle, because of the action, it contributes factors that are of the type e to the minus e to the s, which are doubly non-perturbative in terms of the microscopic theory. So then um, the uh, schematic form that this takes is basically um, if I want to, for example, calculate something like the two level correlation function. So this is the energy space version of the spectral form factor. Um, I uh, will come back to this, but it is actually technically useful to really uh, mimic the, the, the pion effective field theory. There is essentially a, an analog of the pions. Um, and in arranging this perturbation theory in terms of these pions gives um, an expansion which we can identify as a ribbon graph expansion and we can actually associate certain Riemann surfaces to it. So for example, around the standard saddle, I start with a Riemann surface of genus zero, which has two boundaries. And the first uh, uh, non-trivial correction comes where this has one hole, et cetera, and uh, one, sorry, one handle, et cetera. Um, this is then corrected by contributions around this Andreev Altschula saddle, which comes with a e to the two i little s, by the way, which is of course little s is of order e to the entropy, just as a reminder times topologically analogous diagrams, but um, the actual value of these diagrams is somewhat different. Now, um, each topology here, certainly around the standard saddle, we understand this, basically predicts a coefficient of the leading singular term that you find in other manifestations of this quantum chaotic systems. So I, I, will, I will explain more these connections in a, in a um, slide that's coming forth. But what I want to point out is that these are all singular as the energies, the two energies approach each other. So this is a one over S squared singularity. This is a one over S to the fourth singularity and so on. And this, of course, due to the uh, Goldstone massless degrees of freedom or almost massless degrees of freedom. OK, so now um, this was uh, a conceptual overview of, um, so there's a raised hand. I don't see it. Uh, I, it's disappeared, but it was someone called Gabriel Arenas. Maybe it was just- It is probably a good idea to, I mean, I could, I could take questions about what's been said so far. Oh, I think it was a, it was a misclick. Why don't, why don't you go on? Okay. Uh, uh, well, now Raghu question. Mahajan raised the hand. <laughs> All right, you, op you opened that box and now you're gonna have to deal with it. That's okay. <laughs> All right, uh, hold on, let me allow Raghu uh, to talk. Yes, there you go. Uh, hi, Julian. I have a question. Since you mentioned that this uh, other saddle, does it exist in just standard pion physics? And if so, does it play any role there? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and I think it does exist, but I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I think this is an extremely interesting question because in particular, um, a theory that is more like that would be, uh, let's say, a slightly deformed version of n equals to four super young males. And so this is, I think, one of the key questions one should ask there. Yes. I would okay, love to know, you. I would love to know the exact answer to this question. Okay, thank you. I believe there was one more question by Hrant Karibian. Sorry, I think it's okay. Okay, um, yeah. maybe it was the same question. Then I'll go on. So um, now um, I have given you, I think what was more like a um, bird's eye view on this. I, I would advertise nevertheless this paper I wrote recently with Alex Altand in which we really describe um, 
most of the things that I mentioned, or if not all of them, in a great amount of detail. But um, let me give you a summary of uh, applications, and this is just this is just really uh, a selection of ones that I find particularly interesting. So, um, oh yes, I mean I had, of course, I had uh, uh, those names there. It, originally, this comes from mesoscopic physics and is associated with condensed metaphysics, in particular with Wigner and Yefetov. And so there are also copious applications in that field, which obviously I'm not going to talk about, but uh, which are nonetheless interesting. But okay, back. So back to what I want to say. I want to firstly basically tell you about what we can learn about spectral correlations. In particular, I would like to explain from the uh, idea of this theory how we understand the ramp plateau. Uh, structure and how we can analytically control it. Um, I would like to make a comment on SYK. And secondly, I would like to talk about wave function statistics, which also follow from this effective field theory. And I would like to tell you how to think about operator correlations in this context. And I would like to comment on ETH. And finally, I'll talk about OPE statistics and how this relates to what's known as a genus two wormhole. So um, spectral correlations, let's talk about the leading singularity. Um, I've already, of course, introduced Z4 as the generator of the spectral resolvent, let's call it R of E, uh, and of its correlations. In particular, Z4 here is the one that generates the two uh, row correlation. So therefore, of course, let's evaluate rho of E and rho of E primed correlations with this effective field theory. And um, let me just give you an idea of the leading diagram. So what we do here, so um, this of course, again, refers to what I said on my first slide on quantum chaos, there has to be some sort of either the eigenstate ensemble or um, some mild averaging or some other way in thinking of uh, thinking about this average here. But what this here is the, the, the angular brackets, this is just the evaluation in the Goldstone effective field theory. And I'm calling B and B tilde the, um, the fields that parameterize the pions. And you should of course now think of them as being two slash two graded matrices. Well, I said, of course, you should think of them as two slash two graded matrices. That's what comes out of the formalism. So this is a matrix field theory, but one of a very small of a very small matrix. In this case, a two slash two graded matrix, which is of course contrasted with the large Hilbert space size L. And so I'm taking the average here with respect to this coset action. Um, in fact, to just calculate the leading singularity of the uh, of of the two. This um, two level correlation function, I can in fact limit myself even to the Gaussian approximation of this action, but there are infinitely many corrections to this. Then um, I just get the first connected contribution is the one where I, where I contract across these graded traces, S traces, super trace, graded trace. And the reason why I have put here a red projector on the fermionic part and a blue projector on the fermionic part. The fact that it's on the fermionic part is actually not essential, but red means uh, re retarded, let's say blue means advanced. And that again is to be tracked back to the analytic structure, which was dictated on us because we needed uh, advanced and retarded degrees of freedom. Anyway, so I can have contractions across these two traces. Um, I get the propagator of the pions to be just one over S. Uh, if I put in all the factors, then this diagram here of the genus zero Riemann surface with two boundaries gives me minus one over two S squared. And in this normalization S where I've normalized by the mean level density, this factor minus one half is a pure prediction of this theory. And the interesting part is that um, it might be something that you're very familiar with because if I now go to real time, I Fourier transform this to get actually the spectral form factor. I get that the spectral form factor rises linearly in time. And um, if S measured time in mean level space, measured energy in mean level spacing, measuring time in inverse mean level spacings is natural. This is what I call this tau variable. And the coefficient of the spectral form factor is exactly one in those units for the unitary ensemble. And it's two in the orthogonal ensemble, which is actually easy to understand because here we allow time um, inversion as a symmetry. And that means that I have another diagram in which, are, in which I inverse the relative time of the boundaries. So I get twice what I get in the unitary ensemble. 
So this is the ramp. From the point of view of the effective field theory, this is the ramp. I remind you this is non-perturbative in the entropy because of the definition of S, and I get an analytic prediction for the ramp. Now, um, we have um, looked at this because um, this is a, a, a um, you know, prediction of uh, the effective field theory. It's also a prediction, of course, of random matrix theory in the first place. So if we look at these ramp type contributions, the leading singularity should be the same wherever it has been um, um, observed. And of course, um, this has already been pointed out, for example, in this paper by Saad, uh, Schenker, and Stanford. Uh, this here, this is the same as the double trumpet. It gives minus one over two S squared plus regular terms. Uh, we have checked it using um, work in minimal string theory, where this should be related to the annulus diagram between two FZZT brains. Um, and again, um, this gives you minus one over two S squared plus regular terms. We have also checked that this works out for the recently proposed 3D torus wormholes by Kotler and Jensen. Again, you get minus one over two S squared plus regular. So um, the, con the conclusion is that this diagram here not only topologically resembles the wormhole, but it basically gives you the uh, prediction for the EFT for this uh, simplest wormhole contribution in the bulk. Um, if you want more details, of course, go to these papers. And in particular, in our paper with Alex Sultan, we explain how this, this goes in the example of minimal string theory, where there is actually a fairly nice way of uh, understanding this effective field theory from what is the, what, what called the bulk description. OK, now um, let me talk a little bit about SYK. Why? Because SYK is a rare example where we can explicitly derive the chaos EFT. Of course, in some sense, EFTs are less interesting when you can explicitly derive them microscopically. But on the other hand, it's also very nice to be able to do so. The analog here, of course, would be to be able to describe, let's say, the Pyhan effective theory from QCD which we don't know how to do. If you do this in SYK, well, it's still quite a bit of work. And I should say, but for the first time, this was done by Altland and Bagretz in 2017. But generically, it takes the following structure. You have massive contributions in addition to the Goldstones. And then what you find is that, so the Sigma model, the EFT also, it's, it's a nonlinear Sigma model, right? And um, basically, contains what we call a homogeneous term, which is the one that gives rise to RMT physics, plus non-homogeneous modes, which we can uh, interpret as massive corrections. And these massive corrections give corrections to the early time physics. How does it work? Well, if you calculate, for example, the two level correlation functions, I have already introduced this. You can write it as the RMT contribution, exactly the RMT contribution plus an infinite set of corrections, which are massive modes. And the idea is that the RMT result will, res will, result re will reveal itself at, at the time that is larger than the last of these modes decaying. So the mass of the lightest of these heavy modes basically gives you the time at which random matrix theory dominates observables. And you can estimate it explicitly from this detailed calculation. So in the Q is equal to four SYK model, this calculation can be done. And basically, you have to compare omega to delta times n squared. That, that just comes from asking when, when is the contribution of this term here dominant over this contribution. Uh, and you find that it's e to the minus n non-perturbative in n with a prefactor n to the 3 halves. Um, the second resolvent here is the operator resolvent. That's a new result, um, which I will get to. I will also. Uh, introduce what this operator resolvent is. But let me just tell you that it actually has the same tauless time. What I mean by tauless time, this is an energy. But of course, if I go to uh, the time domain, then this gives me a time. And the characteristic time is e to the power n times 1 over n to the 3 halves. So roughly speaking, we find this RMT prediction. Here is our 1 over s squared diagram. I didn't tell you how to get the plateau, but you can get the plateau also from this effective field theory. And what happens is that you have a decaying part, the disconnected part. Then at some point, you have the contribution from the massive modes to the connected part. So it still differs from the RMT prediction. But eventually, these modes all have decayed. And you really start getting from this Taoist time onwards that the um, realistic system looks like the RMT prediction. This is to be contrasted with the extrapolation here 
of just the decaying part, which uh, I call the intersection time, which actually goes to the logarithm of n. Now, last comment, of course, really, um, if you have just one, uh, uh, one version of the theory and you don't, average, you don't average out even over small energy bins or something like this, really what you get is an erratic fluctuation around this and our EFT should be interpreted as giving you the enveloping functions of these erratic fluctuations if you do some small averaging. That's just a side remark. Julian, you have five minutes left. Yeah. So let me talk about wave function statistics. Another class of observables, of course, that we are interested in is matrix elements like this here. The EFT implies not only statistics of the eigenvalues, which we just described, but also that of the associated wave functions or states, if you want. And these induce correlations in operators. Uh, the way to measure this is the so-called operator resolvent. This is actually very simple, similar to the spectral resolvent if it's written as a, function, as, as, a, as, a, as a sum of a delta functions. But let me just take it as a definition. And the um, advantage of this is it's actually computable by adding sources to the effective field theory, which I hadn't before. And the resulting physics is still governed by this causal symmetry. So um, in a forthcoming paper, we will actually show that this leads to a very nice, well, in my opinion, nice universal result, namely that the spectral resolvent um, in terms of an operator basically also has uh, universal spectral correlations, which are what we call the operator sine kernel, because this contribution here looks like the famous sine kernel for eigenvalue correlations. So this is forthcoming work with Altland Nayak and Manuel Vielma. This little trace here, you can actually, uh, the, uh, depending on your taste, you can either have a canonical ensemble, actually it should be the infinite temperature canonical ensemble, excuse me. You can do, look at any micro canonical window. You can even look at eigenstate projectors. This is again in the sense of the Sinai billiards. So what does this mean? Well, it means, for example, that we have, if we go to the time domain, again, analytically, fully analytically shown that generically at late times, uh, you get operator ramp plateaus. So there's a Thales time which in the SYK model happens to be the same as that for the spectral form factor, but is not in general necessarily the same. And well, you have for two, two point correlation functions, um, a similar sort of ramp and plateau behavior. Let me not go into the details of, uh, I, I didn't draw this as a straight line on purpose, but I'm not gonna go into the details why, you just have to trust me on that. And my drawing skills, I apologize. Now, um, Recall, of course, that ETH also makes statements uh, about operator statistics. And in fact, we can, we can associate a universal contribution to these F terms here in the um, random part of the ETH ansatz to our operator sign kernel OSK. And to my mind, um, this also invites a comparison of our effective field theory to the way that ETH correlations um, have been uh, used to argue for the presence of wormholes. So notably in this paper by the UBC group, but um, there are also papers of, well, I would call it the Princeton group. So people in this combination, uh, linear combinations of these authors, and also a paper on ETH by Saad in 2019. Now, um, finally, this idea that wave function statistics um, are interesting actually allows us in a CFT to talk about OPE statistics, because as you can see here, we can think of OPEs also uh, in some sense as matrix elements. And so therefore it is very natural that wave function statistics also in, induces uh, in, the, in this effective field theory, of course, randomness into these OPE coefficients. In fact, such an OPE randomness conjecture is implied in gravity, which was pointed out recently by Belin and Debourg. Um, Belin de Boer. Uh, the motivation, of course, um, for them came from the genus two wormhole, which is that there is a gravity calculation which suggests that um, the computation of the genus two partition function, which I'm um, summarizing here, so this has operator co OPE coefficients squared, sums of OPE coefficients squared, doesn't factorize. Um, the reason is that there is actually a wormhole type. Uh, contribution in the bulk, which is an infilling solution of two genus two surfaces, which is not the square of two handle bodies, which would just be the solid geometry of these guys. Um, actually, the 
gravity solution was written down by the next speaker uh, together with Liot Maus. Uh, so there is a gravity solution, which basically gives this puzzle that the bulk answer for the G genus two uh, partition function doesn't seem to factorize. So this can be summarized by saying that um, if I divide the wormhole by the square of the handle body, then I just get one. So I have this contribution plus I have an e to the minus three s uh, uh, three times the entropy suppressed contribution with some coefficient, uh, the details of which are unknown to me. But um, where can such a contribution come from in the field theory? Well, if the OPE coefficients themselves are random variables in some sense, then this comes from a variance of the OPE coefficient squared, as you can see from the previous expansion, uh, previous expression for the genus two partition function. Now we can ask, does such uh, a non-zero variance actually arise uh, from this effective field theory? And the answer is yes. What we do is, well, we, we basically go to a tripled version of the Hilbert space, we build this um, causal symmetry breaking EFT on the tripled version of the Hilbert space, we introduce sources for an operator of this kind. Uh, we can then get the, the correlation function, correlation between these operators um, by differentiating the, the generating functional, of course. Um, and what we find is precisely the same kind of uh, uh, non-factorization, namely one plus some coefficient here, which we have calculated, but which is a bit too complicated to show you here now, times e to the minus three times the entropy, meaning a non-zero variance precisely is required by the gravity prediction. Now I'll come to the summary then. Basically causal symmetry breaking, I think is, is a very neat way of thinking about quantum chaos, both conceptually, because it tells you um, how you can associate and in what, under what circumstances an ensemble average which is basically generated by the system on itself by its chaotic dynamics. I hopefully also convinced you that you can do a lot of calculations in an elegant way. Um, what is impressive to me is fully non-perturbative framework, which allows you to analytically control this ramp and plateau region. Um, and it also is geometrically a beautifully simple principle. It's a coset space sigma model. And in fact, the allowed cosets have been classified by Cartan a long time ago and can be shown to be precisely the 10 RMT ensembles of Altland and Zernbauer, or be, you know, be in some dual relationship to them. Um, I showcased some applications to SYK, eigenvalue statistics, wave functions. Um, there are obviously many more applications, or I, that's also my hope, but also my expectation. Some open issues. Well, can we add these erratic fluctuations in a controlled way? Is there some degree of universality? What is the bulk picture of causal symmetry breaking? Causal symmetry and its breaking. Well, we have some level of understanding in the context of minimal string theory. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I did not emphasize this here, but you can read this in my paper with Alex Altland. Um, there is of course also some understanding already previously, basically implicitly in this paper by Saad, Schenker and Stanford. Um, um, I think I told you that this FET graph expansion works or this ribbon graph in higher dimension. Well, I have not said that it's only restricted to lower dimensions. It's correct. This works also in higher dimensional boundary theories. To me, an interesting question is how to capture just the leading singular diagrams more generically in the bulk. And to me, the what billion euro question is, um, well, which has already been asked by, by Ragu. So uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a cut of it if we, if we find it out. So what is the Ultra Andreas saddle in higher dimensional bulk space times? I right, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Julian. I think with this webinar, people cannot even put the clapping hand emoji, but, but uh, I'm I sure can we imagine can uh, all imagine that everybody's clapping hands. Um, yeah, thanks, Neda. Uh, all right, great. So questions. We already have a question by Xiaolang Shi. So let me uh, unmute you. Uh, go ahead, Xiaolang. You should be able to talk. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, Julia. So, well, I have two questions. One is about the well symmetry. So um, uh, these two settles do not have the same action. So the, um, should I understand as the symmetry is being broken? Is this financially broken or uh, broken by some other mechanism? Uh, between the two saddles. And the other question is, um, so it seems that our discussion is very general, uh, um, but we 
expected it should apply to chaotic Hamiltonians. So, um, so if I say gradually change the Hamiltonian to uh, integrable Hamiltonian, then something should uh, be dramatically different for the effective theory. So uh, where should I see that condition on the Hamiltonians being chaotic in this theory? Thanks. Okay, so um, the first question was about the vial symmetry. Um, the vial symmetry, I mean, um, the vial symmetry, I guess, is not a symmetry exactly of the action. The vial symmetry is if you take the two derivatives, you have to send energies equal in pairs. And you can, so you can say basically say Z1 is equal to Z3 and Z2 is equal to Z4, or you can say Z1 is equal to Z4 and Z3, uh, Z2 is equal to Z3. Um, and so um, I'm a little so I'm a little bit puzzled by your question. I can't immediately tell you, but I think the answer is it's not immediately a, a symmetry of the action, but it's a symmetry of once you go to the two-level correlation function. But it is simply true that this vial symmetry does map you from the north pole to the south pole of uh, the target space, but it does not. Uh, it, yeah, but the action at the two points is actually different. At one point it's zero because it's supersymmetric and at the other point it's non-zero because it breaks the supersymmetry. The, the other question was, how general is this? Well, that, that's a very subtle question actually. Um, so uh, there is actually a context in which we, we're not able to, I guess, continue continuously, uh, not able to continuously tune it, but you can ask, for example, I showed Q is equal to four SYK results, but you can ask what happens Q is equal to two SYK, which, which, which should have actually Poisson statistics. And um, this has actually been addressed recently by Verbarschot and collaborators. And the idea is that the effective field theory just isn't controlled anymore for a case of an integrable system. And you have to choose essentially a new basis for the Hilbert space, which reflects the large degree of symmetry that comes out. And once you work in that adapted basis, you can actually predict Poisson statistics for an integrable system. But in terms of having a continuous parameter, um, I think that's that's certainly an interesting thing to study. Maybe people in the in the mesoscopic community actually have done that already, but you know, risking I'm saying something stupid, I think it would be interesting to look at a case where you have a continuous parameter that breaks or not doesn't break integrability. Yes, thanks very much. All right, the next question is by Henry Maxfield. Henry, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the lovely talk, Julian. Um, I was wondering about these, um, what you said about these OP coefficients at the end. Uh, how much does the the effective theory depend on uh, details, and then how quantitative are the the predictions you get? So, I mean, I have in mind um, pushing uh, Alex and Jan's analysis a bit further and getting the the action as a function of energy and including one new determinants and so forth. I'm wondering how how much yes. I'd be able to match there. Um, I think that's a lovely question, and actually, you're of course well placed to 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 ask because uh, you know you looked at these these asymptotics of the genus two partition function. I well, it's 100% quantitative, and it makes a prediction. It makes a prediction basically um, of what it looks like at timescales that are bigger than the Talus timescale. And I, I think that if you find a contradiction with the gravity calculation, then there's a real problem. So I would hope that. Um, similar to, let's say, looking at these gravity uh, computations of, for example, the double trumpet, um, you know, these things are interesting functions. The point is, once you take the coincident energy expansion, then you must match this factor of minus one half. And actually, when I was doing the calculations for this paper here, of course, you know, I didn't get minus one half most of the time. And then the reason that turns out that you just need to normalize, of course, by the right uh, by the right uh, mean level density for each system. And then, you know, once you get all the factors of two and pi right, in the end, it always becomes minus one half. So it's fully predictive in that sense. It, 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 I want to think of the EFT as being that it gives you exactly the universal content of, of these quantum chaotic systems that you can be quantitatively 100% sure have to be there. So this means in this OPE context, it's a function of like three energy differences and it's supposed to and be the answer I would the, the leading order is that energy difference goes to zero. That would be my guess. Yeah. Yes. It would be very nice to check. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. 
All right, thanks. We have time, I think, for one more question. So the next question is by Tarek Anus. So Tarek, you should be allowed to talk. Hey, guys. Hello. Um, yeah, I had a question regarding this uh, higher dimensional uh, thing. So in, in your construction, the Goldstone integral is just a regular integral. Uh, do, do you have uh, an, like the imagination that the higher dimensional construction would be a, where these there are fields that uh, are fields in some space time that uh, fill out this Goldstone manifold, or is that correct? Not the, there is basically the the Q field would depend on some additional coordinate, so it could be a space time coordinate, or it could be also um, quite naturally live on the many body Hilbert space itself. In which case, it would be a pretty horrible space that it lives on. But the question that I'm raising here is actually one of principle. So the, this chaos effective field theory can be mastered, even though technically it is very complicated, but it can be mastered for higher dimensional systems. But the, this ribbon, the topologies that are uh, associated to the ribbon diagrams are basically when the thing goes ergodic and you can forget about the, whatever, let's call it base space dependence. But so you're going to get the same topological expansion. The question is, how could you possibly associate these kind of simple genus expansions to higher dimensional, uh, you know, even space times, let's say. And so, of course, there, I guess the, the speculation, since we're at the end of this, the, the wild speculation would be there are some subsector, you somehow project down to some subsector in which you can effectively understand it as a low dimensional object, which has such an expansion. But I, I don't really know how to make this work. I just think it's an interesting open issue. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, Tarek. I think uh, we're out of time for this session. So let's all thank Julian again, uh, virtually behind our computers. The people that can clap will clap. Thank you. Um, I see that there were more questions, uh, more hands raised and more questions in the chat. So uh, please um, don't hesitate to log on to the social interactions and or uh, post your questions on the Slack channel. Right, there will be a Slack for each talk, I understand. So there's please feel free to talk. ask questions. And then also there's this Gather Town, which That's right. promises to be fun. What's up? So thanks, Julian. Uh, maybe you can unshare your screen so we get ready for fun. I'll...